She was a best friend, daughter and caregiver. Pamela Hupp was always helping those in need, but behind her loving facade was an evil person consumed by greed. Pamela Hupp was born in October 1958 and grew up in Delwood, Missouri. She married her first husband just before her senior prom and soon gave birth to her daughter, Sarah. After the couple's divorce, she quickly remarried and relocated to Florida. She gave birth to her second child, Travis, and the family returned to Missouri. They settled in O'Fallon. Pam was an administrator at a life insurance agency, despite being fired from two other companies for forging signatures. By 2010, she could no longer work due to back, leg, and neck pain and began collecting disability benefits. One of Pam's closest friends was Betsy Faria. Betsy was a kind and fun-loving person. She was very social, but her biggest concerns were her daughters and her husband, Russ, who she adored. At the age of 42, Betsy learned she had breast cancer. Devastated by the diagnosis, she tried every treatment available, but nothing worked, and the cancer spread throughout her body. It attacked her liver and kidneys, and it was clear that it would soon kill her. Pam was at her side for the entire process. She took her to medical appointments and did everything she could to support Betsy and Russ. Betsy was very depressed and made dark comments that scared her husband. She said it would be easier if she died rather than putting their children through the trauma of dealing with the drawn-out illness. The once fun-loving woman had turned into a ghost of her former self. She limited contact with others and would only spend time with her husband, her daughters, and Pam. Her family had no clue that she had changed the beneficiary in her life insurance from Russ to Pam. Later, Pam claimed that she did it to guarantee that the money would get to her daughters when they were older. On December 27, 2011, Betsy underwent chemotherapy. It wouldn't save her life, but would hopefully give her more time with her family. Pam drove her home after the procedure. Russ spent that evening at a friend's house. They watched movies from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., and then he drove to Arby's before heading home. When he got to the house, he found Betsy lying on the couch with her wrists cut. After all the disturbing comments she'd made, he was convinced she'd committed suicide. I just got home from a friend's house, and, and my wife, my wife killed herself. She, she, she's on the floor. First responders rushed to the scene, but when they got there, they knew they were dealing with a homicide rather than a suicide. Betsy's injuries couldn't have been self-inflicted. She had 55 stab wounds across her body, a serrated kitchen knife embedded in her neck, and her wrists slashed to the bone. Another knife was left next to her on the couch. By that point, she had been dead for over an hour. Investigators determined her time of death was between 7.20 p.m. and 9.40 p.m. Russ was the first person of interest in Betsy's murder. Police arrested him, and paramedics claimed it was outrageous that he would think her death was a suicide, with Betsy's wounds and the amount of blood in the living room. Pam helped incriminate him, insinuating that their relationship was not as perfect as it might have seemed. He'd start playing this game of putting a pillow over her face to see what it would feel like. I don't know if she said, this is what it's going to feel like when you die or whatever, and then act like he was kidding. Russ was charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. The four friends that he was with that night testified that there was no way he could have been at the house when she died. His cell phone record showed that he was actually 20 miles away during the window of time when she was killed, and he had time-stamped receipts from purchases he made that evening. When first responders arrived at the scene, he had no blood on him and was hysterical, desperate for them to revive her. The prosecution still believed he was guilty and accused his friends of holding his cell phone while he committed the murder so that his records made it look like he was far away when it happened and that they posed as him in stores to give him an alibi. Russ was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. As well as looking after Betsy, Pam cared for her mother, Shirley Newman. 
Shirley was widowed in 2000 and moved into a senior living community so that she wouldn't have to worry about house upkeep. She suffered from dementia and arthritis, but maintained a level of her independence. Shirley stayed at Pam's house on the evening of October 29, 2013, after a hospital visit. Pam dropped her off at home the next day and told the staff that she would probably be too sleepy for dinner or breakfast. A day later, a housekeeper found Shirley's dead body beneath her apartment's balcony. Staff found that the railing to her balcony was broken, making it likely that she had some sort of fall. The assistant medical examiner said that her cause of death was blunt trauma to the chest, caused by the fall and ruled it as an accident. However, she had eight times the expected concentration of Zolpidem, a sedative in her blood. Lincoln County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous note that suggested Pam murdered her mother for the life insurance. My mom's worth a half a million that I get when she dies. Police reopened the investigation and interviewed the housekeeper that found Shirley's body and Shirley's son, Michael. They both said that she wasn't very steady on her feet. The death was, once again, ruled as accidental. On August 16, 2016, Pam made a distressed 911 call. 11. Police rushed to the scene, where they found a man's dead body in the hallway of Pam's home. She said he was the assailant, and they found $900 in cash and a note tucked into his clothing. Kidnap Hup. Get Russ's money from Hup at her bank. And kill Hup. Take Hup back to the house and get rid of her. Make it look like Russ's wife. Make sure knife is sticking out of neck. The man was called Louis Gumpenberger and had never been considered dangerous. The 33-year-old had two children and was a loving and devoted dad and son. In 2005, he was in a bad car accident that left him with permanent physical and mental disabilities. His long-term injuries made it hard for him to find and hold down a job, so he worked odd jobs to support his family. Pam alleged that he attacked her. The car came down really fast on the cross street and whipped around right in front of my driveway because I'm right at the end. Here's the cross street and here's my driveway. So oh. they came out and did this right in front of my driveway and I looked up because it was so fast and startling and somebody jumped out and I was like, wow, somebody, I don't know what I thought, if somebody was hurt, I don't know what was going on. It was so fast and then he ran up, I was halfway out to drive where I was parked and he jumped in my car. He opened up the door and jumped in my car. Which door? Uh, passenger. Front or back? Oh, front. Oh, passenger front. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And um, he had a bunch of stuff in his hands. I don't know what he had, but he had a knife also, but he had something in his other arm. I don't know what he had. And um, he put a knife and kept going, um, just yelling random stuff like, you're going to take me to the bank and get Russ's money. Take me to the bank, you're going to take me to the bank. He put a knife up to my throat there and was yelling stuff. And um, he kept looking behind him like this. So I didn't, I put it in gear and I was thinking how it's going to get out of there when he was looking. And he kept yelling, coming back, and then he looked back again and I hit his arm with the knife and then shot out of the car and ran inside. Pam's story didn't convince the police. In fact, it made her look more guilty. Louis suffered from several disabilities, which made it unlikely that he could perform such actions. I think I was yelling at him, I don't even remember. I think I was like, who are you? Get out of my car, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, bitch, we're going to the bank. And I'm like, and then my mind just starts swirling because I'm like, going to the bank, this is so freaking weird. And I'm like, I'm not going to the bank with you. Get out of my car. And he goes, bitch, you go, we're going to the bank. We're getting Russ's money. And 
he started getting all agitated and excited and that's when I really he was yelling things I wasn't listening because I was forming how the hell I was going to get out of the car. So he was yammering crap, couldn't really understand him at that point, and my thought was to get the, the knife away and get the heck out of the car. That's all I was thinking about at that point. What he was saying, I don't know. As I ran into the garage, he ran after me, I heard the car door shut, and he was yammering stuff again about killing me. Again, my focus was to get in the house. I knew I had my phone in my pocket. I was trying to dial 911. I think I did it three times before it went through on my cell phone. But then I was inside, and he was trying to get the door. I was trying to hold the door. I couldn't get it locked in. And I was trying to get 911 on the phone. And he was saying stuff. And then the door flew open. He got in. It flew open. And I ran into the bedroom. He was yelling stuff. and. As I was going in the bedroom, something again about killing my wife, him and Stevie. Me and Stevie, you're going to kill your wife. And I, so I don't know who that is. I don't know a Steven or a Stevie or Steve. I don't know what he was talking about. He was so then, so but It was really hard. It's like his sentences weren't formed by then. Mm -hmm. And so none of it made any sense, but he did keep saying, get in the car. I ran in the bedroom. I tried to, you know, I shut that door. I was trying to get it locked, wouldn't latch, got a problem with the door. And um, I got my gun, turned around, got my gun, I stand right there, and he was pounding on the door. And once it flew open, that's when I shot him. And I just kept shooting him. And he just kept standing there. Days before Louis' death, a woman was approached by someone that matched Pam's description. The witness said that the woman posed as a Dateline NBC producer and offered her $1,000 to reenact a 911 call. Security camera footage showed that the alleged producer was driving Pam's car. Another O'Fallon resident reported being approached as well. The truth was that Pam posed as a woman named Kathy and, again, told him she was a producer for Dateline NBC and offered to pay him if he reenacted a 911 call. She shot him in the middle of the call and then planted the knife, the note, and the $900 on his body. Her cell phone record showed that she was in his neighborhood, likely at his door, less than an hour before the shooting occurred. Investigators discovered a $100 bill on Pam's dresser that had a sequential serial number to four of the nine $100 bills found on Louis. The knife at his side was likely from a nearby Dollar Tree, and the note was in Pam's handwriting. Pam was arrested on August 23, 2016. She was charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. While in custody, she asked to visit the bathroom, where she stabbed her neck and wrists with a pen. Hop grabs the water bottle to hide the pen, then slides both back slowly, casually. She takes the pen behind her to hide it in her pants, then her neck again. It appears she's looking for her jugular another vein she's about to strike with the pen. That's where she's escorted to the bathroom, where she stabs herself. There's an officer here from the last room. Okay. About five minutes pass when you can hear officers yelling. The prosecution saw this as an admission of guilt and had no sympathy for her. They set her bail at $2 million. Pam pleaded not guilty on January 31, 2017. A few months later, prosecutors announced that they were seeking the death penalty in the case due to the crime and the cruelty it took to target someone with disabilities. Although she refused to admit that she was guilty, Pam entered an Alford plea for Louis' murder. An Alford plea is a plea in which a defendant maintains their innocence, but knows that the prosecution's evidence would most likely result in a guilty verdict if there was a trial. A condition of the plea was that she wouldn't face the death penalty. She said she did it so her children didn't have to witness an ugly trial. Betsy and Shirley's cases were reopened. Shirley's death was changed from being deemed accidental to undetermined. The judge said prosecutors couldn't use Shirley's death against Pam in Louis' trial. Russ never stopped fighting to prove his innocence and find justice for Betsy. He spent years filing appeals and in court hearings. 
Months after her mother's death, authorities questioned Pam about Betsy's death. Aware that she risked being linked to both Betsy's and her mother's death, she implicated Russ in Betsy's death. She also tried to make it look like Louis was a hitman, acting on Russ's behalf. With the case reopened, Russ was released on bond after spending three years in jail. In 2021, Pam was interviewed by police for her connection to Betsy's murder. Shortly afterward, they charged her with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. The exact charges brought against Russ. Again, the prosecution announced they would seek the death penalty. The prosecution argued that Pam killed Betsy for the life insurance policy and that she'd intended to kill Betsy from the beginning of their friendship. Just after Betsy's murder, Pam seemed to plan on upholding Betsy's wishes with the money. I'm gonna make you the beneficiary if you could, when my daughters are older, give them some money. I want my kids to have it. However, Betsy's daughters never saw any money and eventually sued her. Police asking me if I did it, I should do it, it would help their case. Detective Carrick told me, you can do what you want with it, it's yours, but we would like for you to set up a trust for the girl. It's a revocable trust, so I just revoked it. She claimed to be using some of the proceeds to help a family with a family member suffering from cancer. Did you tell anyone, uh, Mrs. Hupp, that you gave $50,000 of these insurance proceeds uh, to a family who had a family member suffering from cancer? No. I told them I was contemplating it. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you on any of my accounts why I do what I do. At that time, it makes sense, so I do it. Court documents asserted that Pam murdered Betsy for financial gain. She insisted on driving Betsy home after her chemo appointment, although Betsy had already arranged transportation, and Pam wasn't familiar with the area where she picked Betsy up. The position that Betsy's body was in when first responders arrived at the scene indicated that she had been killed by somebody she trusted. Pam texted Betsy that she was home at 7.20 p.m., but her cell phone record showed that she was still at Betsy's house. Pam entered a not guilty plea in July 2021, and her preliminary hearing was scheduled for February 2022. Her public defender died of a heart attack, and the hearing was delayed indefinitely. She waived her right to a preliminary hearing. In May 2022, an inquiry into Russ's investigation was announced. He received $2 million in a wrongful imprisonment suit. In September 2020, Pam's husband Mark filed for a divorce, citing that the marriage was irretrievably broken. The divorce was finalized in March 2022. Pam filed a motion to vacate her conviction, claiming that she had been pressured into the Alford plea, but her request was denied as it was considered untimely.